from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you. A uh, second welcome to the uh, 2012 National Book Festival. I'm Nora Krug. Um, I write the uh, paperbacks column for the Washington Post, which is a charter sponsor and uh, longtime supporter of this event. Um, I'm thrilled here today to introduce Nalo Hopkinson, who, um, if I may quote her publisher, has been busy, busily and wonderfully subverting the sci-fi genre since her novel, Brown Girl in the Ring, was published in 1998. Um, since then, she's won multiple prizes and critical acclaim for her novels and short stories, including Skin Folk, Midnight Robber, and The Salt Roads. Um, Hopkinson, who spent her early life in Jamaica and the Caribbean before settling in the much colder climate of Canada, uh, draws on Caribbean and history and language to tell evocative tales that blend fantasy and folklore. Hopkinson, whose father was a poet and actor and whose mother worked in a library, uh, grew up surrounded by books. Um, but she, her introduction to sci-fi uh, came from a much more unusual place. <laughs> um, I don't want to embarrass her, but when she was a child, she said she found a stash of Playboy magazines um, and was looking at the cartoons, which completely baffled her. Um, and then she stumbled upon Kurt Vonnegut's Welcome to the Monkey House which she said she did not understand either. Um, but she found it very interesting. And um, thankfully, that interest has blossomed and given us a distinctive genre that she calls speculative rather than science fiction. Hopkinson, who also teaches creative writing and designs beautiful, interesting fabrics, has recently published her first young adult novel, Chaos, and completed another novel called Sister Mine, which is scheduled to appear this spring. Um, a new work of fiction, along with an essay and an interview, appear in the just published Report from Planet Midnight, um, a chapbook that is part of the aptly named Outspoken Authors series. Um, Hopkins, um, Nalo, who will be signing books at 3.30, um, is here now to tell us more about her writing and her inspiration and all that good stuff. So, welcome. Thank you. I should be on. Yes, I am. Good. Thank you, Nora, for the introduction. I'm not the one who's embarrassed about the Playboy thing, but my mother probably would be. So let's hope she doesn't see this film. So I have um, lived uh, 35 years in Canada. I was born in Jamaica. Um, I now live part of the year in Riverside, California, where I uh, teach creative writing. But I am, for the most part, a Canadian with Jamaican background. And uh, since I've been here, my lizard brain has been convinced that I've been in Ottawa, which is the, <laughs> the Canadian seat of government. And I have to keep repeating to myself, no, you're in a different country, Nalo, it's a different, it's a different seat of government. But what finally nailed it home to me was I was just in the author's tent and uh, two policemen bearing guns walked in. That is such, that is really not a Canadian thing, um, to have <laughs> instruments of war at a book festival. Uh, so I now know that I'm, I'm not in Canada anymore. <laughs> I'm going to be talking a bit about The Chaos, which is my first young adult novel. It came out this spring. It's been a long few years to get to this novel. This came out this spring in July. Uh, the chapbook that Nora talked about, Report from Planet Midnight, came out. And next spring, the novel Sister Mine is coming out. I am not that prolific, um, but I spent the five years prior to this um, quite ill, um, to the point where I became destitute and was actually homeless for two years. Um, I wasn't writing much and contracts kept going past me. So I built up a bunch of work that needed to be finished. And now that I am at the University of Riverside and things are improving quite rapidly, I'm catching up as quickly as I can on all the work I've been doing. So um, a book a year is not usually what I do. Two books in a year is definitely not what I do, and that's probably not going to happen again in a very long time. So I, um, 
have a master's degree in writing popular fiction from Seton Hill University, not Seton Hall, Seton Hill, in Greensburg, PA. And um, I graduated in 2002, I think. In my first year there, I was already a published novelist. I was working on my third novel under contract, um, which is the best way to take a graduate degree in creative writing ever. Um, I was taking a course that was about writing fiction for young people. And the instructor led us through uh, a, an exercise in um, creating characters. And I liked the character that I'd created so much that she eventually became this book. Um, took six years, but it happened. Her name is, um, her real name is Sojourner Smith. She lives in Toronto. She is the daughter of a black American middle class woman and a white Jamaican working class man. And I love how the cover manages to portray the fact that she's biracial. Um, she's born and raised in Toronto, which is one of the more multicultural cities in the world. So there are people from everywhere and all generations of people there. Uh, her nickname, what her friends know her as, is Scotch. It's not short for liquor, it's short for Scotch bonnet. I see some, yeah, a few Jamaicans, few Caribbean people. Scotch bonnet peppers are a very tasty pepper that is one of the hottest in the world. Um, and she's called that because she's a dancer on her school's team and her moves are a little bit nasty. So <laughs> they're hot, so they call her Scotch. Uh, her parents know nothing of this. Um, when she's at home, she is what they want her to be. She's a nice girl, she wears nice clothes. And when she gets to school, she goes straight into the washroom and changes into her hoochie clothes. And that's what she wears at school. Scotch is um, mouthy, goes along with a nickname. She has been moved from one high school to another because in her first high school, um, she was being harassed by the other girls. She was being what we call slut shamed. Um, where a group of girls decide that you're a problem for some reason and they start spreading rumors about awful things you're doing with the boys in the back room, whether or not you're actually doing them. And in her case, she wasn't. Um, when she gets to the second school, though, and that's no longer happening, she, she is going about her own um, adolescent uh, sexual explorations. And she's hiding this from her parents because they are afraid that that kind of behavior will bring the, the, um, the harassing back down on her. And for the record, it's never the behavior of the person who's, who's, um, who's being slut-shamed this way. So there she is. She's, she's hiding what she really is from her parents. At home, she's this good girl. She goes to school where she's on the dance team. She hasn't even told her parents this because it's, it's street dance and they would be horrified at, at the, <laughs> the little tiny booty shorts they're going to be wearing in their practice. The thing about Scotch is she has started seeing things. Um, she's seeing little creatures that float through the air and she's afraid that she's going crazy. Her mom is a psychologist and so Scotch knows that uh, adolescence is a time where if people are going to be schizophrenic that they might have their first schizophrenic break and she's afraid that this is happening to her. What she hasn't really taken in is that there are lots of strange phenomena around the school and that, that other people are having reactions to things that they're seeing and hearing. She doesn't much notice it because high school is a crazy time. People do go crazy in high school. Um, her parents go away for a weekend and uh, Scotch decides to go with her brother, her older brother Rich, to an open mic. Her brother is a poet in training and he he's wants to go to his first open mic. He's afraid, he's nervous, and he and Scotch are actually fairly close, so he takes her. The thing about Rich, about her brother, is that um, Scott, their parents let Rich get sent to jail for a few months because they found him with a blunt. They found him with a marijuana cigarette. Um, and Scotch is very, very angry at them for this. So she and Rich go to this open mic, which is held in a bar in downtown Toronto. And my girl is, of course, underage. Um, she's very good about it. She's drinking ginger ale, but she's no way she should be in there. 
while they are there, something happens. A, a, a large iridescent bubble forms under, under the uh, podium and starts growing towards the audience and Scotch dares Rich to touch it, at which point he disappears and all hell breaks loose in the city of Toronto and apparently in the world. The book is named The Chaos for a Reason. Um, very, very strange things start happening. Um, the main one of these is that all of a sudden there's a volcano in the middle of Lake Ontario. And I mean all of a sudden, I mean in seconds, boom. Now, when I started with this premise, I thought it was fantasy until I began doing research into volcanoes. I can't pronounce the name of the volcano in Mexico. I think it's Barcutirin that um, formed overnight in um, a farmer's field. He came out one morning. There was a smoking hole in the middle of his field. By that week, it was the end of the week, it was 100 feet tall and spewing lava. Within a year, it was something like 1,500 feet tall and had covered the whole village. So I sped up the time just a little bit, but a volcano growing in a week. <laughs> this world is a fantastical place to live in all by itself. I, I cannot invent things that are stranger than the actual world. Um, so through the rest of the novel, Scotch is looking for her brother Rich as the world goes to hell in a handcart all around her. Her parents are away, she cannot reach them. Uh, things are coming out of the lake. People are having strange transformations happen to them. Um, Baba Yaga is in there, because I like Baba Yaga and why not? Uh, <laughs> for people who don't know who she is, she is from Russian folklore. She is uh, a witch who rides in a... Now, I changed it a little bit, so I have to try to remember the actual folklore. She rides in a... In a, cha in a it's a, a mortar, so it's sort of egg-shaped, uh, the kind of thing that you use to pound whatever, fufu, vegetables, grain, in. And she stirs, she, she rows with the pestle. Um, and she's, um, she's a lot of fun to ride, especially the chariot that she rides in. So that's um, the chaos in as much of a nutshell as I ever manage. There's a lot of other stuff happening, but you know, I could be sitting up here, standing up here reading you the book if I tried to tell you everything that's happening in it, and then you wouldn't want to read the book. Um, they told me I should talk a little bit about how I became a writer and how I became a science fiction writer. And it's something people ask me because I'm a black woman from the Caribbean which is not their picture of a science fiction geek. And geek pride, <laughs> thank you. I know my people are here. <laughs> I can hear the Jamaicans, I can hear the science fiction people. Wonderful. Uh, I, um, since I was a child, I started reading at about age three. Um, and I always looked for the stories that were outside the usual. I don't think it's something I decided. Now, people ask me, when did I decide to write, start writing science fiction? Well, I just wrote what I'd always been reading. Um, and it was always stuff that was out of the ordinary in some way. I was very, very fortunate to have uh, a father who was a writer and an English teacher. And my mother, as you heard, is a library technician. Our house was full of books. And um, although my parents were very strict in other ways, anything I could find that I could read they did not monitor my reading. They just let me at it. Um, and from a very young age, I sort of had the feeling that, you know, sure or not, that I sort of know what real life is like because I have one. I want to know about the things that I don't have. I wanted to know about things that were supernatural, that were futuristic, that were um, unusual in some way. And my dad, being an English teacher, um, he had books such as Homer's, um, I'm being very distracted by the noise back there. Jason and the Argonauts, what book is that? No. Odyssey. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> the Odyssey and whatever came after it. Um, Gulliver's Travels. 
um, all the sort of classics that were, were either epic tales or in some ways just unusual. And as you heard, I was reading them even though I couldn't always understand them, which became very good practice for reading science fiction later on because <laughs> I failed science. <laughs> Never mind the fact that I occasionally write it. And I didn't think about writing because there was a writer in the house already. My father was doing that. Writing was what daddies did. And my parents, as I grew up, would keep asking me what I wanted to do with my life, and I had no idea. Uh, so I ended up taking all kinds of things. I studied Russian, I studied French. Um, I did study science very, very briefly in undergrad. That didn't go over very well. Um, and finally, I decided to take a course in writing science fiction and fantasy. Uh, and uh, that's where this leads me to today. Um, the other thing that people ask about, is particularly if they're budding writers, is that everyone says to you that you need to write every day. And particularly in my genre, um, we're very fond of you know, pulling out your daily word counts and comparing them to see who's the biggest. I'm not very good at that. I discovered in my 40s that I've got um, attention deficit disorder. I have something called nonverbal learning disorder, which basically means high verbal ability and not so good at the non at the, at the nonverbal stuff. Um, I knew that. Um, and I also have fibromyalgia. I have a chronic pain disorder. Writing every day with the best will in the world is not going to happen. It just doesn't. It's what some people do when it works for them. It's what I can manage to do for maybe a month if I'm on deadline and late. Other than that, writing every day does not happen. It is possible, in other words, to be a writer and not write every day. Um, what I do instead is I throw myself at the computer often enough that writing happens. You can only spend so much time on Twitter, really, before you get bored and you've got to do something else. So I'm the voice for don't worry about it. I, I hear from a lot of people who want to be writers who psych themselves out in all kinds of ways because they hear this or that thing that they should do or they shouldn't do and they don't think they can live up to it. Uh, it's not true. If you want to be a writer, write. Somehow, just keep doing it. Um, and don't, don't find ways to not do it. The, only, the, the best predictor of success, if you want to be a writer, is to write. The best predictor of failure is to not write. It's that simple and that complicated. Um, so a few years ago, I, my partner became ill and couldn't work. And I said, well, no worries. While you're figuring it out, We've lived on one income before. I'm going to step in and, and you know, do my bit. And slowly discovered I could no longer do what I had been doing. I had been surviving on a mix of writing contracts, teaching contracts, um, and, and consulting in the arts world, and anything else I could do that would bring in change. Uh, and found I could not do any of it. Problem was, because it was so, the, the, the inability to work was so similar to the difficulty I have working every day anyway, I just thought I was going through a bad patch. It was um, way too long in the process before my doctor realized I had developed anemia so badly that I could not read a sentence from one end to the other. Just not enough oxygen going to the brain. By the time I got to the end of the sentence, my mind would have wandered. See people nodding. See, I didn't know that's what it felt like. I should have been able, I, I know what anemia is, I should have been able to tell, I did not. By the time that had been found out, um, my partner and I had been destitute for some years, and uh, we spent a couple of years homeless and couch surfing. And in the um, acknowledgments for this book, I thank the people who literally kept us alive for those couple of years. Um, science fiction and fantasy community, queer community, family, friends, sometimes perfect strangers, people who took us in, uh, who gave us birth when we had none, um, who found little bits of work that we could both do. Um, I cannot thank people enough 
for what they have done to get, help us get back on our feet and get me back to what I, I need to be doing, which is writing. Science fiction community is, um, is, is wonderful, is miraculous. Um, there is a network of people who know each other, people who come to events like this. You see me waving at folks, almost none of whom live in the city I do. I know them because I see them at things we've become friends. Um, and that was how sometimes when we were in some strange country, having no idea where our next meal was coming from or our next roof, someone would say to somebody, these are good people, you can take them in for a few days and we would have somewhere to live. So um, I'm kind of preaching the thank you again, thank you to all of you who've done this. I could not, if I had tried to thank everyone, it would have been the whole book. Um, and it continues to happen. And that kind of generosity is, is, is a balm and a boon. Um, people ask about my being a Caribbean person who writes science fiction. And there are increasingly more and more of us. Partly what happens is folks think that if you're going to write science fiction, it's got to be set in a world that looks either like Mars or America. <laughs> Which is the other notion I have to disabuse people of. Fantasy is based in folklore and in religious beliefs, and a lot of it is um, either Christian or Celtic. But the world is full of folklore, the world is full of religious beliefs, and I write often from the ones I grew up with. Um, I write ba from the folk tales I grew up with. A lot of people have to take their courage into their hands to do that. I've been, again, very fortunate to have to come from a community of writers where people were doing whatever they wanted to, so I knew that it was possible. Um, sometimes I write in Caribbean folklore, sometimes I write in Caribbean English. Um, having lived in Jamaica, in Trinidad, and in Guyana, I know a little bit of all three. Trinidadian is the one that comes the easiest to me, but um, I will often write in those, those languages. And again, science fiction community, we're used to reading things in all kinds of invented dialects, so a real one doesn't phase a lot of people. It's a beautiful thing. Um, I want to read one thing. Let's see. It's two pages long, so I think I have the time. Uh, one of the things about my character, Scotch, being mixed race and being fairly light-skinned, she finds it very hard for people to see her as everything that she is. And I, I gave her a scene that has happened to um, friends of mine who are similarly um, hybridized. She's in this, this bar where she has no right being, and she starts chatting up a guy there, an older guy. So she's very proud of herself, and she's, she's macking an old guy. And um, she invites him back over to the table where she and her brother are sitting. I pointed to where Rich had found us a table, about halfway between the bar and the stage. He looked where I was pointing. His face got wary. So that guy's your boyfriend? I laughed. No, nah, he's my brother. I was testing him now, though I bet he couldn't tell. Thing is, she has come out light-skinned and her brother is fairly dark. He looked at Rich. He looked back at me. He said, you're kidding me, right? You're just trying to pretend he isn't your boyfriend. Oh, he was skating on thin ice. No, for real, he's my big brother. You can go ask him. He got this look of hopeful comprehension. Oh, so he's your half-brother or something? One of you is adopted? Yikes, he could still pull this one out of the hole he was digging for himself, but the signs weren't good. But his was a reasonable question, right? I didn't have to be so trigger-happy. Still, my voice came out a few hundred degrees cooler than before. We both have the same parents, one black, one white. Can't you see how we resemble each other? I came out lighter and Rich came out darker is all. Wow. He visually compared me and Rich again. I never thought it could happen that way. I just figured the kids would all come out, I guess, light brown, you know? Uh-oh. Our champion has only one more chance for a comeback. Can he do it? He said, I think it's so neat that you're each a different mix. You're both unique. Okay, that was a step in the right direction. I gave him a little smile. 
Again, he tried to hide how hard he was checking me out. I knew this blouse would rock with these jeans. He leaned forward and said, but you know what's really cool? What? You don't look like you're half black. I mean, you could be almost anything, you know? Oh, now he's down, down and out. My smile froze on my face. Nothing left but the shouting, folks. I could, huh? Yeah, you could be Jewish or Arabic or Persian. I had a Persian girlfriend once. You could even pass for white. He stopped, a confused frown on his face. Well, yeah, if you wanted to, but you don't have to be black or white. You're like a child of the world. He smiled, threw his arms out to punctuate his not the least bit triumphant conclusion. I slid off my stool, picked up my drink. Yep, that's me, child of the world, daughter to none. I'm going back to my table now. Oh, well, can I come and sit with you guys? He was halfway on his, off his own stool. No, you can't. He stopped mid-slide, one foot frozen in midair, the other on the floor. What, you really mean that? I really do. What's wrong? Did I say something? Oh, you said plenty. He genuinely had no clue. They never did. I was seething as I walked back to our table. I could be anything, right? I could pretend to be Jewish, maybe from one of those old Montreal families, invent a whole different set of, relative, of parents, relatives, disown my brother, maybe, so no one would see him and wonder about me, disown my mom, too. Or I could hint at some exotic Middle Eastern heritage or Greek or gypsy. I could be anything but what I actually was. That would be so freaking cool, yeah, to have no people, no culture. Thank you. So now you get to ask questions. Um, there are mics here, I gather. Just have at. I can't, there's, if you could, because there's talking behind me and though you can't hear it as much, that's all I'm hearing. Uh, Hi, this is Annette Klaus. We're in Border Town together. <laughs> you, wanna, you wanna talk about the Border Town story and how that came to be? Ah, uh, okay, Annette Klaus, the other writer. And um, she's talking about uh, an anthology in which we both have stories that just came out. Uh, anthology is called Welcome to Border Town. Um, it comes from, when did the Border Town anthology start? Some 80s? In the 80s. It's what we call a shared world um, anthology, where there is a world and writers invent different characters and write their own stories set in the world. Border Town is a place where um, it's on the border between the real world and fairy. And it's a place where people from both sides, usually young people, but not always, come when they've been disenfranchised or disowned or they're just dissatisfied. Uh, it's a place where magic works some of the time and doesn't some of the time. Uh, and if you are using anything that is powered by magic, um, it could cut out on you mid, I mean, if your motorcycle's powered by magic, you can go down. Um, and it's a lovely setting for writing about um, sort of that evanescent place of coming to be as a person. Um, my Border Town story is um, written from the point of view of a Trinidadian woman who's found herself there. And I think it's one of the few stories that doesn't come explicitly from sort of Celtic mythology. Uh, I wanted to, to sort of bring that reality has always been in Border Town. The people who created it, Terry Windling, um, w were very aware of what they were doing, and it has been diverse from the beginning, but sometimes the diversity was more in the, the willingness than in the execution. Uh, and so I created this character who is from the Caribbean, who's been living in Canada, who's found herself in Border Town, and I was able to use the various places, the Border Town places that had been already created um, and I don't want to say too much more than that. The, the Border Town series um, came to an end about 13 years ago and has been rebooted by Ellen Kushner and Holly Black. Um, and though 13 years has gone by in Border Town, I mean, 13 years has gone by in the real world, it's only been three weeks in Border Town. So that was the premise we were all given to write from. 
uh, and it was it was big fun. I used to read the Border Town stories when I was in my 20s, and to be in one now is just amazing. I'm not sure who's next. So people, okay, all right. Uh, hello, I'm a creative writing student myself, and I'm wondering. I'm just you know starting to get into it. Hello. Oh. You are. Uh, and I'm just wondering. Whenever you have an idea that you're stuck on, like writer's block or um, you know so something of that you can't just can't get into writing, how do you try to get in? What sort of s tricks do you use? Uh, and do you ever just abandon an abandon an idea and say, you know, maybe this just won't work? And when do you do that? Um, I tend to know when an idea won't work, and that comes with practice. Mostly ideas will work. You just have to find your way into them, but you do get stuck. Sometimes I'll put a story aside and just work on something else. Um, I have a story coming out in an anthology called After in October that I've actually been working on, or not working on, for about three years. Um, but when I am committed to continuing working on that piece, do something physically active. Go for a walk, something that you don't have to think about a lot. Go for a walk, do the dishes, have a shower. Not working out, because you have to think about that or you hurt yourself. Um, as I have found out. And what happens is it can free up the creative part of your brain to just go walk about. And sometimes the solution will come to you when you're, you're, you've distracted yourself by doing something else. The other thing that will often help is trying to describe the problem to someone. It's happened to me so many times, and it's usually my poor, long-suffering partner where I start to describe what's going on, why I'm having trouble with it, and the answer just comes to me in a flash, and I say, oh, thank you, and I walk away, leaving him going, but you haven't told me what, what. Um, so they say writing is a solitary sport. It isn't really for me, so sharing the problem. If you have access to a group of people who are also um, budding writers who are at the same level you are, sometimes showing it to them can help but they have to be good critiquers. If they're just in there to try to show how much better than you they are, they're not gonna be much help to you. Um, so try those three things, because I don't actually believe in writer's block, not for me anyway. Often what it is is my subconscious is trying to tell me something, and I haven't listened yet. I, and it's, it, So it stops me altogether, it's saying, look, something's not working, you gotta listen to me or the story won't happen. And Cray. Hi. <laughs> what are you working on now? I just handed in the copy edited version of my novel Sister Mine, which is coming out from Grand Central in March. Uh, it's about two sisters who were conjoined twins when they were born. They were separated at birth. One of them got the magic and the other didn't. And they're now adults. Um, and their father, who is the Trinidadian Lord of the Forest has Alzheimer's and goes missing and they have to find him together. So that's coming out in March. I have a novel that had to, the publisher actually canceled the contract during my ill years because I went four years without finishing it. Uh, and you know, they can only keep it, hold it over in their books for so long. I honor them for hanging on to it for that long. And I plan to finish that. It's called Blackheart Man. I plan to finish that and don't tell them. I plan to resell it to them. <laughs> <laughs> and short stories and learning how to teach in an administration. I've been teaching since the beginning of my career, but never in a formal way. Uh, I can walk into a creative writing class and go for three hours on very little prep, but all the other stuff, the keeping attendance, the writing the syllabus, the, no clue. So <laughs> I'm teaching myself that stuff. Thank you. It's good to see you. Hi. Uh, I was wondering what authors inspire you or what you read and, and or genres. And also, second part of that, a different question, uh, do you do research for your work? Research, absolutely. You can't write science fiction fantasy without doing research. I don't think you can write anything without doing research, actually. And often surprised that people try. Um, so. I love libraries. I'm so very glad to be here. Um, I read at the Library of Congress many years ago, and it was during a tour, and I was very, very underslept, and I remember very little of it, so I'm glad to be here in a week. Um, yes, I do a lot, a lot, a lot of research. 
What do I read that inspires me? I'm reading a lot of graphic novels nowadays. I actually just met Craig Thompson in the author's uh, room and, and saw his book Habibi and went right out and got it. It looks delicious. Um, there is a, a collection of graphic novels called Bayou, written and um, drawn by a man called Jeremy Love. Think through the looking glass in New Orleans with, in the Jim Crow era with all the politics that entails. It is beautiful. Um, one of my sort of touchstone writers is Samuel R. Delaney, um, one of the first known black writers in the genre, um, and so many others. I, I could just go on and on and on forever about the, the wonderful work that people have written and are still writing that, that continues to, to inspire me. Uh, one writer I'll mention as the last one is Kelly Link. She and I went to a science fiction writing workshop called Clarion together. And the first, hers was one of the first stories I read. And it blew me out of the water. Um, she is a master short story writer. It was to the point where I could have been jealous, but it would like, have been like being jealous of a mountain. Just, there, <laughs> there was no comparison. I love her work. I continue to love her work. And she continues to write great stuff. Good afternoon. Thank you for mentioning Bordertown. I'm a local DC resident and I belong to a local book club that's for science fiction, fantasy, and speculative fiction. So we read uh, Bordertown last month. This month we're reading, another plug for you, uh, Beyond Binary Anthology. And you have a story in there called Fisherman, which I just finished reading last night. Early in your presentation, you talked about your dialogues that you write in. I could have Googled this and probably answered my question in the past 10 minutes, but I figured, well, you're here, I'll ask you while you're here. Which dialect is Fisherman written in? Mo, uh, Trinidadian, simply put. It's, it's the one that I sort of came to language when I was living in Trinidad, so it's the one that comes to me the easiest. I actually can't, I can understand Jamaican, but I can't do that accent. Um, hi. I just wanted to know which is more fun, making up the rules for your given universe or world or whatever, or leaning heavily on rules that actually already exist and sort of filling in gaps. Mm. They're both equally fun. Um, and they're both just as hard, which is which perhaps counterintuitive. Because no matter what the rules are, somehow you have to pull your own style, your own story, your own characters out of that. I love those moments, though, of, the, of boom, when you think, oh, of course, they're pink. And it solves a whole chunk of your story problems. Um, and that happens whether or not I'm drawing on a folk tale. The issue with drawing on a folk tale is that not everyone will know the folk tale, particularly when I'm using Caribbean ones. So I used to, for a while, find some expert who could come on stage and tell you what the story was so that I could then do my riff on it. And um, I got a little tired of it. And I'm sure my readers were getting a little tired of it because you know there's only so many teachers, librarians, historians that you can pull on and have them tell the story. Um, so now I don't. I just write the story based on the tale, and people can figure it out or not. But they're both fun. Yes. Hello. Um, what effect, if any, did Octavia Butler's writing have on your ah. your writing Octavia style? Octavia Butler. Um, colleague, friend of mine who died a few years ago, also a black writer. Um, there was a point in my life I was working at a public library and reading science fiction, as I always had been. And when I discovered that Samuel R. Delaney was black, I had been reading his work and hadn't known it, I thought, well, where are the other black writers in this genre? Where are the other writers of color, for that matter? And working at a library is a lovely thing, because I could go do the research and interlibrary loan all the books which I promptly did, and read all of Octavia Butler's work in about a month. Um, and depressed myself thoroughly. <laughs> because Octavia's work is very, she doesn't pull any punches. Um, and she follows her premises through all the way. Thing is, she uses black characters, she uses situations where people have to 
um, they're put into situations where they have to learn how to live a new way. Um, I think she used to say, if you find people doing things that happen in my books, then something's really wrong. I'm not writing to predict the future. <laughs> I'm writing to tell you what you shouldn't be doing. Um, and a few years later, I was in uh, Barcelona. I went to an event there. I was um, alone. I speak very little Spanish. I was in a hotel run by people who are Catalan, and I speak no Catalan. TV wasn't working for me. What I had was a copy of one of Octavia's books. And it was like coming home. It was like old friends. The effect that it had on me when I first read it was not there. Instead, I was able to see the humor in her work. I was able to, it was like catching up with someone you hadn't seen in a long time. Definitely very, very influential to my writing. And she blurbed my first novel, which I'm still doing the happy dance about 15 years later. <laughs> yes. Um, is it ever like, hard to draw inspiration from something when you're making a new book or is it easy? It's rarely easy. I mean, you have those moments where it just comes boom. Don't wait for those. <laughs> they don't happen a lot. They're nice when they happen. They, 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 they give you the energy to keep going to the end. But I have found that inspiration is... Um, overrated. When I, when I look at, I see the writers nodding, when I look at something I wrote that was like pulling teeth and I had to fight through every word and I look at something I wrote because I was inspired, I can't see a difference. So don't wait on the inspiration, just bless it when it comes. Uh, and, but in between then just keep working because the best way to get inspired by something is to keep working on it. It'll come. It'll, for a while, it'll be awful, and it just, it's like going uphill, but you do come to the crest of the hill, and then you're, then you're just boogieing. Some of the way you described um, in your reading reminded me of Charles DeLint. Was he an influence of yours at all? Talking about Border Town, um, yeah. he was one of the uh, original authors of the Border Town series, and I... I, of course, paid a lot of attention to him because he's, he's from Canada. So he was um, a fellow Canadian also writing in my genre. Uh, he took the city of Ottawa, which, which particularly when he first started doing it, could be a very dry city and made it magical. And that was just amazing to me. So yes, I have been reading his work for a very, very long time. Uh, and of course, that kind of influence um, creeps in. Uh, he was one of the people who had a black characters in Border Town. Um, and I actually pulled his character Stick into my Border Town story so I could make fun of him because Stick is very, very stuck up. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, excuse me. Um, I'm currently taking a writing course, and uh, we've gotten to the part of uh, the use of vernacular. Um, in the, it's rather a, a well-established uh, book, the text we're using, and it states that it's best to avoid it. Uh, now, the stuff I write about is usually going to have some kind of cultural mix, and I do tend to like using it. Uh, you yourself, would you suggest that you do uh, keep to the uh, official line of avoiding vernacular or go ahead and use it? Because it suggests that you... Uh, instead use word selection and uh, syntax instead of... I do both. You do both? Yeah. Do you uh, really have to have a well-developed ear in order to pull it off yes. well? Or yes, it's... actually you need one for both. You need a well-developed ear. You need to listen to people very well. Um, when I'm writing in Jamaican, sometimes I will go more with the syntax because if I, if I spelt the way that Jamaican sounds, um, nobody else would understand it, even though it's English. I got into an argument once with a, a bunch of science fiction writers who said they didn't understand why people had trouble with vernaculars because English is English is English. I said, no. And they said, well, prove it to me. And I'm going to, my accent will suck, but there's a proverb from Jamaica that goes, if cow didn't know I'm chotol tan, him wouldn't chance pear seed. <laughs> so, Ah, I'm going over time. So absolutely do both, but develop your ear. 
Thank you. All right, we're out of time, way out of time. Thank you all for staying. <laughs>